Hello everyone and welcome to today's Mondap webinar in association with Busy Lance Legal Consultants covering the personal data protection framework in the UAE. My name is Dan Sampeo and I'm joined by a wonderful panel to take us through today's discussion. Saifullah Khan is an international trade, IT and policy lawyer with more than 20 years of diversified and multi-jurisdictional professional experience, serving a large client base in the domestic and international markets. His areas of interest include trade remedy laws of the World Trade Organization, customs law, competition law and data privacy. With respect to the emerging discipline of data privacy, he advises clients from different jurisdictions on data privacy compliance and cross-border transfer of data. Alfred Stroller is the founder and CEO of Stroller. Alfred was a general senior partner in the Deloitte and Touche Middle East practice. Alfred is a certified public accountant of Ireland and the, and the UAE. He possesses over 40 years of successful professional experience, providing audit and assurance, tax consultancy and financial advisory services to a range of clients in the Middle East and Europe, and brings with him a wealth of experience in the GCC region in, assur in assurance and advisory engagements. And completing today's panel is Saeed Hassan Khan, Saeed has more than 20 years of experience advising clients on issues such as taxation, corporate, regulatory compliance and contractual obligations and in re representing clients before the authorities. Mr Khan has developed a keen professional interest in emerging laws on personal data protection and has gained an understanding of the underlying concepts and principles governing global data protection laws, including the EU's General Data Protection Regulation. Now, before I hand over to the panel, a housekeeping item, you can submit questions to our panel by typing them into the questions pane of the toolbar on the right hand side of your page. The panel will endeavour to answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A session, but please do reach out to them after the, webinar, uh, after the webinar for any additional information. It's now my pleasure to hand you over to Saeed, Saifullah and Alfred to begin. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Dan, uh, for the introduction. And uh, um, I would, I would uh, briefly start uh, and then um, Alfred Strola uh, will follow and finally Saeed Hassan uh, will end the presentation. Um, I, I, uh, there is a lot of uh, eco nowadays uh, about the laws on uh, personal data protection and uh, uh, most of us uh, have been uh, frequently uh, hearing about the uh, data protection regulation in the European Union and the cases uh, being undertaken by uh, the authority in Europe. Um, I would briefly explain uh, in my presentation uh, why uh, there was a need of uh, personal data protection law and why they have been developed and enforced in uh, different jurisdictions. Uh, I will not uh, talk about the uh, uh, regulatory provisions or the legal provisions of any particular law. Uh, my, my fellow uh, my colleagues will uh, talk about the uh, legislations uh, in, in UAE and other, other jurisdictions. Um, actually, uh, as we know that the personal data protection is uh, all about the right of uh, uh, privacy uh, to protect the uh, privacy right of the uh, natural person, the individuals. And that right actually empowers the uh, natural person uh, on a certain uh, key indicators that I will show in my presentation. Can we move on the slides? Okay, so so firstly, I'll talk about that privacy of individual uh, and then the rights of privacy, uh, the rationale behind these laws in, in different uh, jurisdictions the data protection and privacy legislations worldwide and uh, what the personal data protection law uh, is all about. A few, briefly, a few very basic concepts and then rights of the data subjects and the obligations of data controllers. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, coming towards this first slide, I was, I was uh, telling that we have heard about the GDPR and the uh, basic concept of these laws is the uh, protection of privacy of individuals and uh, what the privacy right uh, gives to the natural person actually it depends upon certain key determination that when the the personal data of an individual can be used by others how others can process your personal data and for what purpose uh, others can uh, use your personal data so these are the key determinations in each and every legislation. 
And um, I would like to say that obviously, yes, if, if uh, the right of privacy is protected in a society, obviously there is a very, very positive impact on the behavior and actions of the individuals. And uh, resultantly, what it ensures uh, is the human dignity, uh, the safety and the self-determination. And when we talk about the human dignity, it is about the right of the individual to be valued and respected for its own sake and uh, be treated ethically by all means. When we talk about safety, the safety means safeguarding the privacy of the individual. And when we talk about the self-determination, it means that the individuals have the control over their own personal data. Uh, meaning thereby uh, they may be able to choose how their personal data may be used and uh, for what purposes. So they have the control over their own data. Next slide. The right of privacy actually is traced way back to 1948 uh, when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted by the UN. The Article 12 is the relevant article for us, uh, which says that no one shall be subjected to arbitrary interference with his uh, privacy, family, home or correspondence, nor to attacks upon his honor and reputation. Everyone has the right to the protection of the law against such interference or attacks. So essentially, uh, these laws provide uh, protection to the um, individual rights of the data per subject, which is the natural person. And we will be discussing the same concept uh, in, uh, later on in the webinar. Next slide, please. Uh, if you talk about the rationale, which is a very important uh, background of uh, the reason why these laws have been developed, uh, these are four basically rationale about uh, the, the, the basis of such laws, uh, protection of individuals, right of privacy, empowering individuals, business enabler, and necessity of time. And I will explain all of them one by one in the subsequent slide. But before moving on to the next slide, I would like to uh, point out that there had been difference of opinions and still there could be difference of opinion about the uh, enforcement of these laws and regulations in different jurisdictions because there are two school of thoughts. Some of them uh, believe that probably uh, the such kind of a regulations on data privacy law would hamper the growth of IT uh, industry and it might also slow down international trade. But there is another school of thought which says that it is a very much required and it is very much needed for the protection of the uh, privacy right of the individuals. I remember that in 2018, um, the, uh, during the fourth e-commerce week in the uh, uh, Geneva by UNCTAD, United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, uh, where I was participating as a speaker and a moderator. Uh, we had a discussion on, on a number of sessions uh, about, about this issue and uh, uh, there were different of, difference of opinion uh, noted at that time as well. Uh, but still, I would say that uh, we, uh, the, the governments in different countries, they believe that it is an important regulation uh, which should be enforced. And even after 2018, there are a number of countries in different uh, regions who have adopted uh, this law. Like, like in, in, in Gulf, if you talk about Gulf, UAE, um, then uh, Bahrain, then Saudi Arabia, uh, they have uh, developed this law after 2018, I'm telling you. And if you talk about uh, Africa, uh, the Nigeria has this law. Um, South Africa, uh, even in China, and if you talk about South America, Brazil, and uh, even one of the countries, Egypt, in the African region. So these countries have recently developed uh, laws on personal data protection, uh, even after 2018. So in spite of having a different uh, uh, difference of opinion, I think, I think uh, most of the countries now, they realize that they have to have this law. Next slide, please. Um, the uh, um, protection of individuals' right to privacy um, uh, has to be ensured, but how? The question is how that can be ensured. Uh, without having a, a, a regulatory framework or the legal framework in your country, you cannot ensure uh, the right of privacy of individuals. So that, that means you have to have a law. Um, and once you have a law, uh, then that law gives birth to the regulatory authority or enforcement authority in your country. And that in enforcement authority or regulatory authority, they work as a deterrent uh, for those who process personal data of the individuals. And at the same time, those authorities, they provide 
a platform uh, to the individual natural person for the redressal of uh, their grievances if there is any breach of uh, their private or uh, personal data. And uh, moreover, the, these laws and regulations, they also provide harmony, uniformity uh, to all these stakeholders. Either you are an individual as a data subject or you are a data processor who is processing the individual's data or you are a regulator. So everybody would be certain about their uh, rights and obligations. And that can only be achieved if you have uh, these laws in force and the regulatory framework in force in your country. Next slide, please. Um, the laws and personal data protection, that definitely helps individuals in many cases. Uh, the first one is obviously the right uh, to privacy is preserved and uh, that can only be preserved if you have the law in your country. And then uh, it also empowers the individual that he has a control over his own data and they can decide that how and for what purpose their data can be used. So it gives uh, a right and empowerment to the individuals. And finally, uh, this enforcement right to protect the personal data uh, can be achieved, obviously, uh, with the regulations in place. Because these regulations, as I said earlier, provides a complete redressal mechanism uh, for the data subject uh, that if there is any kind of infringement uh, to their rights uh, of protection of personal data, they can always come to the authority and uh, knock at their doors. Next slide. There is a very positive implication of having uh, such laws and um, regulatory frameworks in your country for business entities. Because you know the businesses or the companies who are compliant uh, with the regulatory framework of their country, they get more trust and loyalty from different stakeholders. The customers would be it would feel more easy to share the data and transfer the data to even other jurisdiction uh, if they know that there is a legal framework, uh, very well placed legal framework is there in the country where they are sending their data. And um, what the result would be for the company who is fully compliant they will get a more uh, expansion in the global market uh, they will get more recognition in the global market obviously people would like to work with them uh, thirdly they would get a competitive advantage uh, over the non-compliant companies so obviously if a company is fully compliant with the data protection law of their uh, country or if, if, if you talk about the uae uh, although we are we are waiting for the executive regulation to come uh, the law is already there so the companies who will follow the law quickly and they, if they get themselves fully compliant, they would be seen much better and more trusted as compared to their competitors. Um, likewise, um, obviously, obviously, if, if you comply with the regulatory framework, which is in your country, you will be getting more market share in the digital economy. I would, I would give you one example about uh, McKinsey. There was a study done by McKinsey in, in the year 2020 uh, for uh, North American customers about the collection of personal data and uh, as a result of that study you know the result was 87 percent of the uh, customers they said that they would not like to work with the companies who do not have a secure system for the protection of their personal data and likewise 71 percent of the consumers and the customers uh, were of the view that they would not like to share the information their personal information to, with the companies who, who share their sensitive information uh, with the third party without their consent. So, so it has a very, very, um, uh, I would say, a direct consequence for the business. And those who are compliant will take the benefit and those who would not comply will lose the business. Next slide, please. The necessity of time uh, is to have a regulatory framework is um, very obvious because we all are living in the IT era. We, we prefer to perform all our transaction uh, digitally, either it's a banking transaction, shopping or uh, travel arrangements, even education and training is being done electronically. Uh, even the business and the commercial transactions are being preferred now uh, to be performed electronically. So under such a situation, when you prefer to perform all your um, transaction, your personal transactions, either banking or others through electronic means. This means that you are sharing your personal data and sharing your personal data poses the personal information uh, to uh, vulnerabilities. And in order to uh, avoid uh, such a vulnerability, you need to have a law, the regulatory framework in place. So until unless you have a proper regulatory framework in place, it is difficult to ensure 
that your personal information, which is going from one place to another electronically will be secure. It would be difficult. Next slide, please. The social media, we all know. The social media use is extensive nowadays. Uh, the cross-border flow of personal data is quite extensive. In a social media, if we talk about social media, we use our photos, we share our photos, we share our videos, we share our audio notes uh, through social media and even other uh, personal identifiers, which all are personal data. So uh, if we are frequently, and as we are frequently uh, sharing our personal information on social media, um, uh, so quite often, we need we need proper law for the protection as well and if if there is no um, the proper regulation in place the misuse of data could be it could identify theft uh, it could result into unauthorized access it could author result into financial loss and it could result into a reputational loss as well uh, next slide please data protection and privacy registration worldwide uh, do you hear me i think it's okay do you hear me properly we can hear you saifullah thank you okay okay this this uh, graph actually shows uh, the data protection and privacy legislations worldwide so if you see uh, there are different uh, different countries in, in different parts of the world who have uh, the data protection law in place already. Next slide, kindly. So out of 194 countries, 137 countries have uh, already put in place legislation to secure the protection of their personal data and privacy. 71 countries, uh, they already have, 71% of the countries have already had the legislation. 9% of the countries, uh, they have the draft legislation, 15 uh, countries, uh, they, they have no legislation, and 5% of the countries, uh, they have no data by UNCTAD, because these statistics have been taken from UNCTAD. Uh, so they believe that for 5%, uh, there is no data available. So these, uh, these uh, percentages, uh, the statistics clearly shows that the global economies and the world leaders they have uh, taken cognizance, cognizance, cognizance of the fact that the uh, personal data protection is the need of uh, the requirement uh, right now. So, so everybody appreciates uh, that they need to have a personal data protection law and they are uh, following it. Next slide, please. Okay, now the question here is that wh what the personal data protection laws are all about. Um, one thing one thing is to be very clear one thing it should be very clear in our minds that the law laws on personal data protection they do not uh, try to restrict uh, the use or the exchange of personal data neither they could you know because it is the necessity now uh, of exchanging personal information from different means uh, the only thing these regulations and laws they they just want to regulate the use of an exchange of personal data by having a suitable regulatory framework and what that framework does is they, it provides protection actually of personal data of the natural person which is called data subject and give them rights to ensure uh, the protection and then there is an obligation uh, the users of the personal data which we call data controllers and the data processors they are obliged to ensure that the protection of personal data is in accordance with the provisions of the personal data protection law in their country. And about the enforcement, uh, the laws are implemented and enforced by a public sector regulatory authority having powers to process complaints and to impose fines. Next slide. Uh, these are um, some very, very basic uh, few concepts which I, I would like to highlight here because you are going to you are going to have details in the next uh, presentation. Uh, the personal data is any data which is related to any and to any identified or identifiable natural person. And data subject is a natural person to whom personal data relates. Data controller is the one who determines the purpose, methods, standards of processing of the personal data. And then comes the data processor, the one who processes personal data on behalf of the data controller. 
Next slide, please. The laws, it, all these laws on data protection law uh, in every jurisdiction, they provide rights uh, to the data subject. The data subject is the natural person whose data is collected. And few of the rights are the right of access to information, right to request personal data uh, portability, right to rectify or erasure, right to restrict processing, right to step, stop processing, right to object automated decision making, including profiling, and right to withdraw consent. Now, all these rights have to be respected by the data processor, data controller, because in case you do not give these rights to the data subject, then you will have to face penalties. I'll, I'll again give you a one example. In the year 2021, Austrian Post, they received a fine of 9 million euros. And why they received this fine? Because they did not agree on emails which they received from a data subject uh, as the uh, as a notice as a right uh, for the data subject to inform the data controller about uh, any of the per, uh, these rights of communication so so what the austrian post says that um, we can have your uh, communication through postal mail we can have your communication through other means but they avoided or they they did not accept the communication by email. But the Austrian authority says that if a data subject sends you an email and uh, if he wants to exercise one of the rights, which uh, you have, you can see right now, you are, you are in, that are in front of you, then that email should be considered as a proper way of communication of exercising the right by a data subject. So what I'm what I mean to say is that the uh, data processor and controller have to respect these rights by all means. If they do not respect the right of the data subject, they will have to face uh, huge penalties. Next slide. Um, then you talk about the obligations of the data controller and the data processor. Now this is one who is collecting the information and processing for a particular purpose. Um, a few of the obligations are only to process personal data with the consent. Obviously, without the consent of the data subject, you cannot process the information. Processing must be fair, transparent, and lawful. Now, this is called a lawful purpose. The data collection uh, of uh, by a data processor or a controller uh, uh, can only be for any a lawful purpose. Processing only for a specified purpose. So this is called purpose limitation. You have to tell the data subject the purpose for which you are collecting information. Only to use personal data which is necessary for the specified uh, purpose. This is called a data minimization. You know, you cannot uh, collect uh, information much more than required for a specific purpose. You only have to collect the information which is relevant for the processing of a particular purpose, which is a lawful purpose then not to keep personal data beyond the time for it, it was collected. Uh, then the obligation is the accuracy and the correction of personal data and the safety and security of the personal data. I will again give you one example about the obligation. Uh, and there was a case in 2020 by Data Protection Authority of Germany and they imposed penalty on H&M amounting to 35 million euros. Why? Because H&M was collecting much more information of the employees, uh, which was actually required for processing of their employment. So H&M was uh, penalized uh, by 35 million euros. But why you are collecting so much of information, extra information, which is not needed for processing of the employment? Uh, so uh, you have to respect the right of the data subject. And then as a data controller, you have to fulfill your obligations as well. So this was the, the background which I wanted to give uh, as a startup uh, for this uh, webinar. And uh, thank you very much. I will hand over uh, to our very learned speaker, Alfred Stola. And uh, the floor is yours, Alfred. Thank you very much, Stola. That was very useful, very informative. Um, I will quickly now take you to a very important subject, which is the cross-border transfer of data. And, uh, our protection, uh, the, the data protection officers, and uh, these subjects are a must in every law that we have seen. Seventy, almost seventy-five percent of the world now is adopted. Um, the main subject I'm going to uh, please next page. Uh, Cross-border transfer uh, of personal data. Uh, we will uh, briefly go through the UAE law. 
the ADGM regulation and the DIFC law. And of course, then the data protection officer, which is a very important person, depends on the volume and the transactions that each company is supposed to maintain. Uh, the UAD, the ADM uh, regulation, the DFC law, responsibility of the DPO, the data protection officer. Next slide, please. The EULA on personal data protection regarding cross-border transfer and share of personal data under Article Number 22 of Data Protection Law Number 45 of 2021 uh, is very clear that personal data might be cross-border transfer from UAE with very strict measures and adequate level of protection. Uh, to to a state or authority having strict personnel data protection. So you cannot you cannot just transfer data for another state or a, or a territory when you have to make sure that the, where the data is transferred to, they have equal laws and equal regulations that protects that data from being uh, misused. So the data subject and exercise the right related to the imposition of appropriate measures against the data controller or processor through a regularity or juridical entity. Without that, is not permitted according to the UAE uh, law. So, uh, to extend or terminate the data or territory with whom UAE has bilateral or multilateral agreements in respect of personal data protection. Unfortunately, currently there are no agreements with any state authority as we speak. But of course, there will be more executive regulations with which will clarify. The executive regulation yet to be issued will provide further guidance on the cross border transfer of personal data. Next slide, please. The, AD, the ADGM, the Abu Dhabi Global Market Regulation, and the DIFC law, uh, uh, they, they require adequate level of protection. And they're very, very strict, most uh, free zone, financial free zones in the UAE, one in Abu Dhabi and one in Dubai. They're very, very strict about the personal data. The personal data may be transferred outside ADGM or DIFC on the basis of equal level of protection that they have in accordance with the laws of the ADGM and the DIFC. Appropriate safeguards in the absence of any adequate level of protection personal data may be transferred outside AD and DAS on the basis of appropriate safeguards. The appropriate safeguard include and uh, a legally binding instrument between the public authorities. Next page, please. Binding corporate rules, standard data protection clauses, approved code of conduct, and approved certification mechanism. Now, uh, I'll give you one example, which is uh, of specific situation in ADDM data protection law. In the absence of an adequate decision pursuant to section 41.3 or 41.7 of the ADDM data protection law, or the appropriate safeguard pursuant to section 42, include binding corporate rules, a transfer of set of transfer of personal data outside of ADDM, or to any international organization must take place only in the conditions specified under section 44 of the ADGM data protection law. So it's very, very strict. You have to know about these laws and regulations before you transfer any data outside. Next slide, please. Uh, Now, uh, the UAE uh, law on personal data protection regarding data protection officer 
here what we call DPO or in brief DPO under article number 10 and 11 of the data protection law number 45 of 2021. The DPO, the data protection officer, is required to be appointed when the processing is likely to result in a high risk to the privacy and confidentiality of the personal data due to adoption of new technologies or due to volume of data. Now, if you have this, you, you are obliged and you have an obligation to, uh, to appoint a DPO. DPO is also required to be appointed where the processing involves a systematic and overall assessment of sensitive personnel data, including profiling and automated processing. Because of automation and hacking and all these sorts of things, you have to have a very, very uh, system proof and actually all hacking and uh, uh, firewall, and all this protection in place to make sure that these data are not really filtered out of your organization. The ADGM regulations, uh, DPO is required continuous. DPO is required to be appointed where processing is carried out by a public authority, except for force acting in their legal capacity. Of course, if you have a court order, if you are asked, are asked to, to present it, then uh, you have to comply with it. DPO is required to be appointed where core activities of controller or processor, which require on the basis of nature, scope, and purpose of processing. Regular and systematic manager of those subject on a large scale. DPO is required to be appointed where core activities of the controller or processor consist of processing of large scale or special categories of personal data. Next slide, please. The DIFC law, the uh, DPO is required to be appointed by the commissioner, the IFC authority, and by the Dubai Financial Services Authority. DPO is required to be appointed by a controller or a, a, a processor performing high-risk activities on a systematic or regular a controller or processor boss, then above may be required to designate a DPO by the commission. Next slide, please. Now there are certain responsibility which we have to address very uh, appropriately. Uh, responsibility of the DPO common in UAE law, ADGM regulation and the IST law. The responsibility of the DPO, among others, include monitoring the compliance of data controller or data processor within the applicable legal framework, informing and advising the data controller and data processor and their respective employees who carry out personal data processing about their obligation under the applicable legal framework. Here, this requires a lot of training from each uh, entity and proper advice and continuous monitoring that this is our observed. Acting as a contact point for the consent regulator. So you have to have somebody who is always in contact with the regulator and updating him on this process. I would like to thank everybody. I will transfer you to my colleague, uh, Saeed uh, uh, Hassan Khan, and he will take you from here. And after that, we will take your question and answers accordingly. Thank you very much. Saeed, please, can you? Uh, thank you, Alfred. Thank you, Sefula. You have given a very informative presentation and information during your uh, presentations. And uh, hello to everyone. Uh, today, I will be discussing some uh, basic concepts 
which are common in various jurisdictions, especially under the United Arab Emirates law, to understand the whole process of personal data protection. Uh, Established in very detailed uh, mention the rationale behind and the jurisprudence behind the promulgation and enforcement of laws on personal data protection. So my presentation and my intervention will be uh, will highlight what these basic principles are and what uh, what uh, what basic guidelines are there in the law to be followed by the person to whom this um, uh, law is applicable. So next slide, please. Um, I will give an, uh, an overall uh, overview of the topics or the uh, topics which I will be discussing. I will be discussing about the legal framework, uh, what law is applicable in United Arab Emirates, and an overview of the UAE law, how it works. Then, more importantly, I will uh, um, spend some good time to define and to explain a few definitions within the law, which I say some terminologies or the concepts which are too necessary to understand the legal framework. Then I will discuss about the applicability of the UE law, then what is the regulator do to enforce the law, and then uh, there is an important topic uh, about the consent of the data, a data subject, and then I'll be uh, discussing in details, SEPLA has already highlighted, but I'll be discussing in some further details, what rights are available to the data subject and what does it mean? And then what obligations the data controllers has to have to, to fulfill, to comply with their, the requirements of the legal framework. Then there's a topic of data breach notification. I'll discuss about that in the, in the end. I will be discussing about what are the fines and what are the administrative sanctions in case there is some uh, violation or contravention of the legal framework. So next slide, please. Uh, in UAE, there are three regimes of the law, the codified law, uh, available and working. Uh, the first one is the Federal Decree Law Number 45 or 2021 on Personal Data Protection. It is uh, a federal level law and is applicable uh, across the seven Emirates. Then uh, there are two specific laws, uh, uh, specifically uh, applicable on two financial free zones. One is Abu Dhabi Global Markets, and the law, name of the law is ADGM Data Regulations 2021, and the other function zone, free zone, which is DIFC, Dubai International Financial Center, and the law is applicable there, law number five of 2020, the DIFC law. During my intervention, I will mainly be focusing on the legal provisions as contained in the main end law, which is Federal Decree Law number 45 of 2021 on personal data protection. And next slide, please. Uh, the laws on natural uh, personal data protection all across the world and including UAE have uh, interconnected three spheres. And they are, uh, this, uh, and this slide is very important to, uh, to, to understand the whole concept of the law. So uh, at the first stage, there is the first sphere is are the natural person like we all. The law is meant to protect the personal information of the natural person. So the first sphere is the natural person who have got the rights. Because the purpose of the law is to protect the interest or the protection of personal information of the natural person, that's why extensive rights are given to the data subjects. On the second side comes the, so you can see data subjects have got the rights. And then comes on the second sphere comes the persons who use the personal information of the natural persons. They are called as controllers or the processors, and the law, in order to protect the national persons, have placed certain obligations on collectors and processors. So they, the collector and processor, have to apply, have to comply with these obligations. At the third stage, there comes a regulator. The purpose of the regulator is to regulate and implement and enforce the law. Under the UE law, data office the regulator who has to regulate the law. Uh, I will uh, discuss in detail uh, the rights of the data subjects, the obligations of the controller, and the uh, functions of the regulator in a while. Next slide, please. So, as I mentioned, that uh, 
to understand uh, on a holistic view uh, what is the personal data protection all about is we need to understand or to, to to know some basic concepts which are part of the law as a definition given in the law so i will start my uh, the first concept i will take and uh, i will take to explain to the audience is personal data uh, very interestingly, the name of the law is personal data protection law. So the personal data to understand what is personal data is very important. So the legal definition which is contained in the uh, uh, in the law is there in the slides, and which is quite uh, inclusive and quite detailed one. But uh, if I can say in a simpler words that personal data is any information which directly or indirectly is capable to identify a natural person. So it is a personal data. So uh, some quite obvious examples are like my name, my email address, my physical address, my passport number, uh, my uh, so, uh, social security number, my driving license number, my voice note, my pictures, through which I can, uh, anybody can identify myself is a personal data. So next slide, please. Another important uh, concept is sensitive personal data. In fact, the sensitive personal data is part of the personal data, but is defined separately because of the reason that to process the sensitive data, personal data, there's some, they, are put, they are putting some extra measures to protect the data while they are being processed by the, person, uh, by the data controllers. So simply the sensitive personal data includes like biometric information, religious beliefs, um, uh, biometric uh, genetic data, or the philosophical or religious views, so, or the criminal data also. So this is keep, uh, purposely it is kept separate from the personal data, uh, definition of personal data to give more importance for the data controllers to be more focused or to be more attentive while processing this uh, sensitive personal data. Then there is a concept of data subject. Uh, Sephora has talked about it briefly. So data subject is natural person. As I mentioned, that the purpose of the law is to protect the personal information of the natural person. So the term which is being used all across this uh, legislation is data subject. So myself, I am a data subject for the purpose of this law. Any person, any natural person who is subject matter of you know, personal data protection law is called data subject. So whenever we see uh, or uh, listen any uh, the, uh, the terminology data subject, it means a natural person in the context of personal data protection legislation. The next slide, please. Uh, the next two concepts or definition which we, I would like to, uh, to highlight are the persons who use the personal data of the national persons. So one is the controller and the other is processor. So uh, the definition is different and later on I'm, uh, during my presentation, I will give some, uh, uh, some factor which can distinguish or which can differentiate between who is controller and who is processor. And this definition is important for controller and the processor to understand because the law gives different set of obligations and the requirements to meet by the controller or processor. So the person, a person or the company or a business must know whether it is a controller or the processor in order to imply or to comply with the requirements. So the controller is simply a person. It is a detailed definition given in the legal terminologies, but in simple words, I would explain from my audience that a controller is a person like a company who decides to collect the data, who decides to collect and determines the collection of personal data. Just an example, if, for example, a university or a college, while taking a new admissions for their, uh, for, their, uh, for their degree program, they ask the students or the applicants to give their date of birth and anything. And so that means they are deciding to collect the data. They are determining what data is to be collected. So the university or the college is for that matter controller. Now, what is a processor? Processor is a person, it may be a company or a natural person, who acts on the directions of the controller. The processor is one who cannot by itself decide to collect the data, but he is the person who is only to act under the instructions of the uh, data controller. In simple words, we can say a uh, processor is a third party service provider who provides services to the data controller. So uh, after that, uh, next slide please. A uh, very important concept of consent. Consent is heavily uh, recognized mode of permission or mode of using personal data to the data controllers, which means that uh, without consent, all the data controller must have 
obtain a consent for the data for the, from the data subject before it can process the data. So the, in, in simple words, the consent, the meaning of consent very clear, but these are, uh, there must be three ingredients present in the consent. Consent must be clear. It must be specific. It must be unambiguous. I will give uh, afterwards a few examples upon the nature of the consent, why it is so important. And the ne next slide, please. Uh, okay, we, uh, we have talked you know, more about the processing of personal data. Always when we talk about, we listen about the personal data protection laws, there is a word or a terminology used, processing. So what is processing? Uh, processing uh, is a very extensive and all-inclusive definition, which I say it starts right from collection of data till the erasure of data. So what process, what action I, uh, data control takes from right from collection of the data until he transfers, he process, he validate, he, alter, he makes some alteration, he make adoption, he storage, recording, structuring, and even sharing with others. Disclosure is also part of the processing. So uh, anything a data controller do on the personal data right from the collection till his final destruction or eraser is processing. The last, uh, next slide please. The last uh, concept or definition which I would like to discuss here is uh, personal data protection. Uh, you, uh, you remember that I started um, uh, this definition of the concept from the, uh, from the definition of personal data, which is part of the uh, title of the law, personal data protection. So now I'm talking about the whole uh, title of the law is personal data protection, and this term is defined here, but this personal data protection. So again, in simple words, personal data protection are the technical and organizational measures which a data controller or a person is to take in accordance with the law in order to protect the personal data. So the, the, the personal data protection definition is already there, is always is there in the law, just to explain what does it mean and how it can be protected from vulnerabilities. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, to continue my discussion about the uh, about the significance and the uh, importance of these uh, uh, these few concepts which I defined about the personal data consent and and, uh, and all of the definition, I will choose a few examples to highlight why for a, from a compliance perspective, if uh, when this law is applicable to a company, so the the company or the business need to understand what is personal data so that he can or he, it can identify. It, uh, the law is applicable on which data and law is applicable on or is not applicable on which data. So uh, my question over here is to audience is whether an exam script is a personal data or not. So this is a case study, it was a actual case happened. A candidate was there in Ireland who appeared in an examination. When he failed, he requested uh, his examining body to share or to give him access to his exam script considering that his exam paper or exam script is uh, personal data. Uh, the, ex the request of the candidate was rejected uh, because the examining body was of the view that examination or answer paper or the examination script is not a personal data to be shared under the laws of the personal data protection. Uh, the battle goes on and it went up to the stage of Court of Justice of the European Union. And it's very important what the Court of Justice and European Union held. I'll read it out loudly. The written answers submitted by a candidate at a professional examination and any comments made by an examiner with respect to those answers constitute personal data. So I'll go back to my simple word definition that any piece of information which can directly or indirectly identify a natural person is a personal data. So the court, so the court of justice in the European Union held that the, even the exam, uh, examination ex, uh, script is also a personal data. So next slide, please. So uh, I have talked about the consent. So what is the significance of consent? The, just an, another example, uh, there was an online lottery service in Germany. And when the, the, uh, the user logged in to use the lottery service, there was two tick box. One was the unchecked tick box to receive third party advertisements, uh, which the user can um, take at his own choice. And the second was a pre tick box allowed the online lottery service to set cookies to track users online behavior. Next slide, please. Uh, 
The next slide, please. So the question uh, which came before the uh, court of justice uh, of the uh, European Union was whether a pre-ticked pre box is a valid consent or not. Uh, I would emphasize that, that the user of the uh, online lottery service were able to uncheck this. Uh, I mean, if I'm a user of the, uh, that lottery service, so I can uncheck this by saying I am not open to, uh, to, to use cookies for my machines. But the question came whether this action by the lottery online service provider was, uh, was in compliance of the general data protection law or not. But court said there is no valid consent by way of a pre ticked checkbox, which the user must deselect to refuse his consent. So even there was an option to deselect. But the action or the behavior of, of the online uh, uh, lottery service to give them induced to just go on is against the law. And then consent must be explicit, explicit and the controller be able to demonstrate that explicit consent is obtained. So it is the importance of the consent. So uh, for a compliance perspective, again, it's important that we must know how to take the consent and how to be able to demonstrate if it required that we have taken the consent. Next slide, please. Uh, there is an example of uh, an employer in the Netherlands who processed the biometric uh, data, fingerprints of their employees without consent. So the, the, on the complaint, the case went to the Dutch protection, Data Protection Authority um, that the employer has violated the law and he has not taken the consent before processing the biometric data. And the biometric data is the sensitive person data for which some additional requirements are there to be met by the data controllers. So the, uh, so the employer took the uh, very, uh, very, uh, very obvious defense before the authority that the machines which he is deployed for capturing the biometric um, uh, impressions are from an ISO certified vendor and they are safe. And second, he says that the data is not misused. There is no la uh, hacking of the data. There is no breach of data. The data of his employees were safe, he says. So when there is no loss, no damage to the employees caused, for not taking the consent. He said, please uh, pardon me and do not impose some penalty on me. But on the other hand, what the authority says, it is on the next slide, please. The authority did not accept the, uh, the grounds or reason taken by the employer and said the authority held that the processing of biometric data without consent has violated the relevant provision of GDPR. And the second important thing, the controller or the employer in that case must be able to demonstrate that he has obtained the explicit consent of the data center. So next slide, please. Now, yeah, this is fine. So uh, I'll just briefly, uh, it's already uh, uh, much talked about who is controller and who is a uh, processor. So uh, this, slide to, uh, this slide and the next slide will give a brief uh, determination how we can determine that one uh, company is a controller or a processor. So uh, there are some criteria to, to, to determine or to come to know whether a person is a controller or a, or, um, or a processor. For example, if uh, a person is able to make decision on the outcome of the process, is a controller. And another example is that if he is a person who is, to, who is to take decisions about the national person based on their processing, that he is also a controller. There are a few exa other examples are there, but I am not uh, reading that all. They are simple. Can we go to the next slide, please? Again, uh, the processor, I explained that the processor is a person who acts on the instructions and directions of data controller. So, uh, for example, if he's not able to decide what data is to be collected, from whom, uh, from whom he's to be collected, and what are the lawful basis, what are the purpose of the, he's not deciding the purpose of the uh, processing of data, so he's a data processor. Next slide, please. Uh, these are the example of processing. Just um, when I was talking about the definition of the concept of processing, I say it uh, starts from the collection of data till its erasure. So these are all examples of the collection, uh, processing of uh, personal data, like collection of compliance data, capturing fingerprints of compliance for attendance purposes, capturing video images by security camera. When uh, some uh, some visitors come to our offices, the security people get their uh, ID card number or the telephone number. This is also the processing, analyzing or um, sharing and transmission to others also a part of processing. So next slide, please. Now, this is another important uh, provision of the law. I would say it is the scope of the law. 
So this, uh, the final decree law number 45 of 2021 of the United Arab Emirates is applicable on three, on three cases. Number one, a data subject who is who has a domicile or place of business in UAE. For example, I am living in uh, UAE. I have a domicile. I have a place of residence. So this law is applicable to me. Then a controller on, on a second note, uh, a controller or processor who is established in UAE and pro processing personal data of individual importantly inside or outside the UAE. So there are two conditions. The controller processor must be established in UAE. What does it mean that it must be established a company uh, have got a, a license or the trade license or the uh, incorporation certificate to work in the UAE and if the controller and processor is processing either the data of the person in UAE or the outside UAE. And the third stage is a controller or processor who is not established in UAE. That means they have not gotten any business license or the trade license in UAE, but they are processing the data of individuals who are in the UAE. So on these three instances, this law is applicable. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the continuation of the earlier slide. Uh, um, the law, uh, the instances or the authorities or the processing where this law is not applicable. The law is not applicable on governmental data or the governmental authorities, uh, personal data in possession of security and judicial authorities, uh, personal data being used by a real processing, personal data for personal purposes. This is important to know because, for example, all of us in our mobile phone, we are maintaining a directory. So I'm a, I'm a, by definition, I determine to collect this data. I am a controller. This is an in-personal data information, but for personal purposes, this is not included and the law is not applicable. On health personal data, law is not applicable. Banking and credit personal data is not applicable. And importantly, the free zones, which do have their own special law relating to the personal data protection, the, this law is not applicable, except in example that uh, for ADGM, which is a financial free zone, and DFC, which is also a financial free zone, they have their own specific laws. So these uh, their own specific laws are applicable. Next slide, please. So the functions of the regulator are um, um, are there. I will not go um, spend much of time on this. The, I will only say the prime function of the regulator is to implement and enforce the law. And in that connection, it can impose the penalties, decide the complaints, and settle the appeals also. So please, next slide. And uh, next slide, please. I'll explain this. Next slide, please. So um, uh, I have emphasized on the need of consent. But uh, as Sephala said, that these laws are an enabler. They do not restrict the processing of information. And that's why the law recognizes the instances or the circumstances when the requirement of consent may be bypassed, or which, uh, or we can say the, uh, the, uh, the instances where the, consent, uh, the requirement of consent is not there. So these are necessity for public interest, where there is no requirement to have the consent. Person data made public by the data subject itself, so there is no requirement of the consent, uh, concept of consent comes arise. Necessity to initiate or defend any claim or rights and legal actions, judicial security procedure, there is no requirement to have a pre-consent, uh, necessity for occupational preventive medicine to assess working capacity and price. The next slide, please. Necessity for the protection of public health. In, in all these cases, uh, uh, the consent requirement is bypassed and the data can be processed without taking the consent. So I'll come to the next slide, which is rights of the data subjects. Uh, so I'll, try, I'll spend some time to explain what this right means. So right to access to information. It means that uh, our data, uh, what is the concept of right? Right means when uh, a right is given to a data submission law, it is enforced. That means if the data controller do not accept my request, so I can ask the authorities, I can know the door of the authorities to enforce this law. So that's why the concept of the right is there. So the right of access to information is there, that data subject has the right to ask the data controller to give him access, what data he's processing, for what purpose he's uh, uh, processing, what controls he has maintained for to protect my data. Again, the second right is right to request personal data portability. It means that my personal data kept with one data controller can easily be transferred or shared with another data controller. Right to rectify if my data is incorrect, it is not correct. So I have a right to go to the data controller, say, please 
correct my data or to erase my data. Next slide, please. Right to restrict processing. It means that if I'm claiming as a data subject, if I claim that my data is not inaccurate, is my data my data is inaccurate. So I have the right to ask to the data controller, please stop processing, restrict the processing till you have corrected my data. The next right is right to stop processing. This is a very important right that when, for example, I have withdrawn the consent. So uh, I have the right to ask to the data controller that please stop uh, my processing. Another important right, which is the uh, last one is right to object to automated decision making. Automated decision making is a situation where some decisions are being made about a natural person purely on the basis of analytical analysis without application of the human mind. For example, uh, a higher amount of traffic violation fine is imposed uh, on a person who was a criminal based on his criminal past criminal conduct without considering the present circumstances and effects of incidents. So the data subject has a right to object if he's, if he's being subjected to automated decision making. Next slide, please. This is about the, uh, the obligation placed on the controller. Sephora has already discussed this, but this slide shows these are the seven principles which our data controller is obliged to follow. Number one is the lawfulness, fairness, and transparency. The data must be processed on the lawful basis and openness and transparency. Giving access and giving and accepting the uh, request of the data subject as being data right is one component of the fairness and transparency. Then there's a concept purpose limitation that the data which is originally obtained for what purpose, it cannot be used for any other purpose. Data minimization is that we can keep only the minimum of data required to fulfill that purpose. Accuracy is that the data must be accurate with respect to its context. Storage limitation is that if I, I, keep, I ask the data for, for a particular purpose and this purpose is finished for six months, for example, so after six months, I'm not uh, obliged to keep this data beyond. Security is about the data personal protection, protection of uh, personal data. Uh, the data control is obliged to take all security measures, technical and organizational measures to, uh, to ensure the uh, security of the data and the accountability important thing the data controller and data processor are applied to make uh, are accountable for their action okay fine and the next slide please um, we talk about the protection of personal data just in case there is a breach so what has to be done so in the case of breaches in certain cases the data controller is to notify the incidence of breach to the relevant regulatory authority and these are four instances when he is required to report the breach to a data regulatory authority when there is a risk to privacy of the data subject or there is a risk to confidentiality of the data subject or there is a risk to the security of the data subject or there is a risk to the rights of the data subjects next slide please uh, what needs to be done, it is mentioned uh, in this slide, we can see that uh, while making a data breach notification, a data controller is to describe the nature of the breach, uh, what likely effects it has done, and importantly, what measures data protection has, uh, data controller has taken to, to rectify or remedy this breach. My last, uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, as, as of now, the federal decree law of uh, number 45 of United Arab Emirates has not specified the amounts of fines. A cabinet decision is yet to be issued, which will define what is the violation and what is a relevant fine. Just very quickly to give an idea to my audience in the next slide, please. I will I will show, I would like to show what are the level of uh, penalties and the administrative fine in other regimes, for example, GDPR across the Europe, the penalty for, the maximum penalty for the contravention is 20 million euros or 4% of the global turnover, whichever is higher. In ADGM, it is maximum 28 million dollars. And for DIFC, the way international financial centers, the amount of, maximum amount of penalty is 500,000 dollars. So thank you very much, and my presentation. And uh, now we'll uh, welcome uh, uh, the question put by our audience. Thank you very much for that, Saeed. I think just looking at the time, we, we should have time for just one or two questions from the audience. And we have had a number that have come in. So if you've sent in a question that we don't have time to answer, um, they will be sent onto the panel and we will be in touch. And we do in, encourage you to get in touch with the panel as well. You can see their contact information there. Um, if I ask um, this first question, which came in from Manish, is UAE federal data law applicable 
on employees' data for banks and healthcare? Oh, okay, if you know, I'll take this uh, question from Manish. Actually, the um, UE federal decree law is not applicable on the banks and the healthcare. But, but at the same time, why this is not applicable? Because the Central Bank of United Arab Emirates and the health department has its own set of regulations to protect the personal data of the customers of the bank, which are consumers, and the patients of the health department. So whatever is not subject matter of that regulations issued by the health department or issued by the Central Bank of UAE are to be subject matter of this law. So coming to this specific question, whether employees data for the banks and healthcare is subject to a UE law as long as long the UE central, the central bank of UE or the health department do not provide any specific provision to deal with the personal data of the employees of the bank or the healthcare service provider, then this law will be applicable to, to that extent. Excellent. Thank you, Saeed. Um, our final question I will direct to Alfred. I hope you'll be able to answer it. If not, we can certainly follow up afterwards. This is in from Moeen. And he just asked, and I think this is in reference to your presentation, what is meant by binding corporate rules? Uh, I think you're on mute at the moment, Alfred. Um, sorry, I'll, I'll repeat that. Thank you very much. This is a very valid question. As you can see in the absence of other decisions pursuant to section 41 of the ADGM, what I mean here by including binding corporate rules, as you know, whenever there are laws and regulations put in place, this uh, laws and regulation has to be part of your corporate structure and policies and procedures. So uh, they want to make sure that when you transfer data out of ADGM, that corporate entity or that uh, bank or that uh, entity has proper cro corporate rules and regulation and policies in place that they keep the data well protected. Hopefully that yeah, I would just like I would just like to add and to supplement the, the comments of Alfred about the bonding and binding corporate rules only with the requirement that these binding corporate rules are approved by the relevant regulator. Excellent. Thank you, Said, and thank you, Alfred. Just looking at the time, I think that we will need to wrap up at this point. But thank you very much for sending in those questions. As I say, they will be sent on to the panel who will be in touch. We will also circulate these slides with the contact information um, and a recording of this session to you. If you do have any questions, please do get in touch. But I would like to extend my thanks to Saeed Saifullah and of course, Alfred for your fascinating presentations and your insights and your time today. I really hope um, we can have you back again soon. And I would like to thank you for being with us today. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, so thank you once again, please do get in touch if you want um, any of your questions answered. But I will say thank you again and have a lovely rest of your day. Goodbye. Thank you, Goodbye. Dan. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan, and Good thank morning. you all thank the participants for attending today's session. Thank you.